Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Comics Watch. I am Nick, and here is the master of the ships himself. Jared, how you doing, buddy? That's about an accurate assessment of my character. Thank you. <laughs> so the reason I've gathered, uh, gathered you here today is to talk about a character who is very well dear to my hearts, all of our hearts. We're talking about none other than the Tick. What? <laughs> gotcha! 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 I hate the tick. You, what are you talking about? The tick's annoying. See, that was a test. I was seeing if you were listening, and you passed. Good tick. job, sir. The tick, cheese Spoon! You see what I have to deal with? Hey, I do not regret a single thing. Of course! Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, we're actually here talk about probably the greatest comic book character in the history of everything. And Peacemaker. He had to. <laughs> to be fair, I was actually going to do another troll. I was going to say the flaming carrot. So you kind of just cut me off of the past. So bravo, good sir. But anyway, Thank you. no. We're here to talk about Batman. And in and on other characters like him, uh, in particular, like so, Jared, you know how like Batman has been around for almost a hundred years. Almost, yeah, exactly. Uh, it was like nineteen thirty nine, I believe. Yeah, that was because he was like the year after Superman. Yeah, so Superman was thirty eight. We we all know that. I mean, this isn't nineteen nineteen thirty eight anymore. He looks good for a thirty eight year old. I had to. This isn't 1938 anymore, Jared. Apples don't cost a nickel. <laughs> oh, I love I, that reference. In BBS, I, I, by the way. Yeah, exactly. I knew th that's one where if you know, you know. <laughs> Pretty much we all know. But, but anyway, so like I wanted to talk about why is it that characters such as Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and even Silver Age characters like the X-Men, Spider-Man, you know, they're from the 60s. But why why do why have they stood the test of time and the others, like characters that were created three years ago, why are they all but forgotten? Well, to start off, the thing about let's take Batman. The thing about Batman. Well, the, the reason why I, I've always felt that Batman is like the number one D at least DC superhero is the fact that I, for the most part. Anyone can be Batman. All you need is a lot of money to, to, to finance all your training and stuff. But that's it. The, that is a legitimate career choice. Like, we're not going to be Superman because I don't have Kryptonian powers, unfortunately. That would be really fun. And I, I'm not an Amazon princess from another island. Although I, I, have mean, my, we... I have my suspicions about Sammy, but that's besides the point. Yeah, I was about to say we can't all be Snatter Queen. I mean, yeah, exactly. On. But the, the thing is, is that, and particularly... so. What they normally do. See, here's the thing. The difference between the characters of old and the characters that that, that keep being self-inserts now is, the, is A, the self-insert part. But B, because here's the thing about Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman specifically. Anyone can identify with them to some degree. As opposed to when these writers make a self-insert character, they make it super hyper niche that, of course, no, of course that that fraction of a percent of an already fraction of a percent that reads comic books are going to identify with the character. And, yeah. Like, yeah, like, like uh, characters, like relatability is certainly something. And these characters, while they hit certain demographic, they're still built off of like uh, very universal, relatable themes. Like take Spider-Man, for instance, Spider-Man, his whole shtick is, yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can lift a car but I can't pay my rent. 
Yeah. You know, like, like, like the classic Spider-Man dilemma is on one side of town, Aunt May is dying and he has to get the formula. And the other side of town is the vulture. You know, and it's like, mm-hmm. Sp- and it's like, a, like Spider-Man is a character that we can easily just like throw ourselves into and be like, you can see yourself as Spider-Man. Like, like sure, the, the, the swinging around we can't relate to, but like the, the day-to-day stuff of being Peter Parker, we get that, we understand it. And because mm-hmm. we un- we are so intimately familiar with the spot, the Peter Parker problems, it's not that hard, not that much of a stretch for us to project ourselves into Spider-Man and his problems. Or we've also had, like, take the X-Men, for example. I say this every single time. The thing about the X-Men that makes them fantastic, I said this last week when we covered Phoenix, is that anyone that has ever felt, like, othered in any way can identify with the X-Men. Granted, yeah, there are some some eras in X-Men where it's heavily to one group. like yeah, like with X two, when it comes to have you tried not being a mutant or something like that? Yeah, I got that. But even that, even that, it was like really only specific parts of it. Like, like X two wasn't really LGBT. Like, yeah, I had that scene, which I think that scene is amazing. It's but great. Like, it was more, more. It, it had that, and then other things. Yeah, but th- that's the reason why. Th- that's the thing I always tell people: if you want to be representative of people you have to make it general enough that everyone can identify with the character because then the character preface let me preface this by saying this is assuming that a competent writer is writing the comic because obviously that can influence it but it's assuming we have competent writers as if you market it to as general an audience as you can of your comic book audience it will catch on Mm-hmm. Case in point, the freaking Court of Owls. Mm-hmm. That's a part. That's a. I count them as one character, by the way. That's mm-hmm. a character that is not going anywhere in Bat. Uh, yeah, uh, that's not going anywhere. That will be forever with Batman. Because the great yeah, part about that Court of Owls is really like one of those like genius ideas where, like, when you hear about it, it makes perfect freaking sense. Not only that they exist. But also, why you haven't heard heard of them by now? Because like, and here's the key part: an organization Wait, that is so good at hiding even Batman. Like they were literally that's hiding the point. in Wayne Tower. Point. That's the point. Like that establishes them and is a credible threat too. Plus, you got the whole eyes wide shut. You got the whole like conspiracy. Like the it fact is a that Nightwing perfect villain for Batman. The fact that they that they were involved in in, in Gotham as far back as Nightwing's origin because they were going to, to turn Dick Grayson into a Talon. I mean, even farther than that. Even like, farther. Like, it's like it's it's one of those things where like they were so good at ingratiating themselves into the lore, where like they they took all the gaps in the lore and they slotted themselves in perfectly. Where a lot of times, of like bad writers when they try and insert like, oh, this character was always here, like like it, like when they say, oh, that kid from uh, Iron Man two, oh, he's Peter Parker now, like, oh, okay, you know, like whatever. But but, but the way they did it with uh. Court of Owls, it makes perfect freaking sense. Yeah, and the, and the thing, and again, because I want to emphasize this one part: the part that hooked me when I first came up, uh, when I first read the concept of the Court of Owls, is that Batman didn't know about it. That is the key, because Batman seems to think, and to quote Scott Snyder, he went, "But Batman prides himself on knowing everything about Gotham." Then all of a sudden, you put this massive thing he missed. Like, when you have an organization that is so good at hiding, they fool literally the world's greatest detective. Because remember, Rachel Ghoul calls him detective. Rachel Ghoul acknowledges him as the world's greatest detective. So, like, that means something. So, like, or- so, 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 like for, so for the world's greatest detective to be fooled, it, <laughs> it establishes, like, and, it, and they do it in such a way that it makes sense why Bruce didn't or, catch on. It's like, speaking of Batman, Red Hood. Because here's the thing about Red Hood. Here's why he works because he is a good foil to Batman because he's what 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 Batman could be. In other words, he's like a cool foil of like if Batman kills, here's how effective he would be. Well, yeah, because the best villains are the ones that challenge the hero's ideals, mm-hmm. and and the ideals that that Red that Red Hood challenges are is Batman's no kill policy. Like that is directly what Red Hood challenges as a villain as an antihero. And I and I, I like 
I love it because Red Hood isn't really doing this from a place of hate. He's doing it from like from a place of love. You know, like like he like he like he said like if it like the fact that he like the fact that the, that the fact that that um Batman let the Joker go in, like instead of not doing anything that that emotionally upset him because it, it, it like do I mean nothing to you like it just comes back to the basic human emotion. Yeah, and and the thing is, is that again he's like. Just kill one person and we're good. But it's like even going on. Let's say you get let's t take it over to like the to, to the other member of the Trinity. What makes Wonder Woman so great? Here's the thing about Wonder Woman. Because um, speaking of characters that endured, the whole Trinity thing that happened naturally. That wasn't like DC like had these three characters and like no, they're the Trinity now. They're gonna be the I mean, most popular. While they were the three most popular, they really started to market them as the Trinity. Uh, I'd say like early 2010s is when they really started to push the whole yeah, Trinity concept. True, but it was like it, it wasn't like DC had to like force and say no these three characters. It's like uh, they they got to that point because because every because the audience because they resonated with the audience of the of DC. Yeah, that's why I'm saying like all DC did was they took something that was already there. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of crystallize it because you go back and look at even like Justice League, the Trinity is still there. Like yeah. even informally, like the Trinity, is, like they still act. They like have the episodes where it's just the Trinity, and and that's the thing, and, and that's my point is that DC looked at, to to your point, DC looked at because they were the Trinity without being called the Trinity in the early days of comics because they they were like the characters that DC always looked to. Here's who who a superhero should be. Okay, uh, quick side tangent. Jared, are you from The Legend of Zelda and the and the Triforce? No. Okay, so I'm gonna get really nerdy here for a moment, but we're Where's we're my literally Zack Snyder a... dweeb clip. Well, you're on my castle, so I know. Um, so basically, the Triforce is made up of of three triangles. I know, very concept. So really, you have power, wisdom, and courage. Okay, so power is definitely Superman for sure. Um. I would, okay, so which one would you say is courage? Like, uh, I would say Batman and wisdom is Wonder Woman. Yes, absolutely. What's funny is uh, so power is usually the one done by the villain Ganondorf, uh, courage is usually Link's uh, Triforce symbol. That's like he's like the main hero of the game, mm -hmm. and it's really funny that the way you put it because wisdom is usually Princess Zelda's Triforce. So, well, that, that works. Even, Without even trying, Jared, you perfectly matched it up. Like, <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. But also going on to Marvel, the thing about why the Punisher has endured that long. Because here's the thing about the Punisher. Granted, to a degree, he doesn't work in the mainstream Marvel universe because, uh, granted, everyone kills in the Marvel universe, but he goes to a little bit of an extreme. But you see, with him. He's okay, and, and and so I think a lot of people like him more than Marvel will tell you because if the if the Marvel if the Avengers need something done but they don't want to have their fingerprints on it, they turn to Frank. Yeah, I would say a lot of people, uh, like mainstream audiences, like they're not so much fans of the character as they are fans of the idea yeah. of the character. Mm -hmm. Um, and you see that a lot with the Punisher, like. People aren't necessarily fans of the Punisher. They're fans of the idea mm -hmm. of the Punisher. And the idea of the Punisher is one man doing what it takes to get things done no matter what. You know? And right uh, along. Like, 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 let's say you have a, a politician's son uh, murders a young woman he was on a date with and he gets off scot-free. Frank goes and kills that guy. Everyone yeah. wants that guy dead, but the justice system fails. And so Frank does what no one else will do. In fact, fun fact, uh, in Ramadi in 03, uh, the, the seals that were deployed there would spray paint the Punisher skull everywhere they went so that it would communicate to the enemies, hey, we're coming for you. Well, if you watch the movie American Sniper, that, that's what that is. Display. That's what that is. But it's like, and, and the thing about all these characters, 
because they represent basic parts of being a human, ironically, because we also have like the, the, the Justice League and stuff because they're gods. It, even Green Lantern, he works because everyone has been through a situation where they've where they've been afraid, but they will power the hell through it. Yeah, that's why characters like Jessica Cruz have have been latch, latching yes. on really hard. She she is not going anywhere. I guarantee that's another character I think is going to be with Green Lantern for a while. Now, Teen Lantern and Far Sector, the Green Lanterns that make no sense in the universe, I think they're going to they'll be. Away. I can see characters like Kyle and Guy kind of fading fading away because 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 like honestly, Kyle never really got as big of a push. Uh, John Stewart gets the push because he's the Black Green Lantern. Whenever they need another Black person, they just hire mm -hmm. John Stewart. And that's not to say John Stewart isn't a great character because he is, but it, there are certain reasons why he gets pushed, and he is a good character. Um, and Hal is is the Green Lantern. Hal is like Barry, where it's like no matter how much you go away, you're always gonna bring it back to Hal. Like you're always gonna bring it back to Barry. Yeah. Thanks to Jeff Johns, but there you go. But like I would say, John Stewart is like the Wally West. Of Green Lantern. Yeah, he is. But at the, and that's the thing because you, what you do is you take you you take something that everyone, not just one group, you take something that everyone can identify with. And guess what? Mm -hmm. That character sticks around. I'd say about eighty-five to ninety percent of the time. Maybe even higher than that. I'm just trying to be generous. Uh, I think uh, Ghost. Like I think Ghost Spider is gonna stick around. The like the Spider One character. Well, yeah, because she's. Is, the thing about her is that she's fun. She it, and the costume design is freaking amazing. Like I love that costume. Yes, it is such oh a my gosh. beautiful costume. It is so good. She has a very compelling storyline where, like, Peter was the lizard in her universe. So he was the death of Gwen Stacy, if you will. So yeah, like she's a drummer in a band. Uh, you know, called, called the Mary, Mary Janes, Janes. First off, that's hilarious. It's a really, it's a really, it's a really good. Like, I really dig but her universe. The thing about Miles, though, he worked when he was the only Spider person in the universe. That's why he worked in Ultimates and why they wanted to bring him over because he was popular. Because Peter was dead, and honestly, by the way. I read the issue w w where they do the handoff from Peter to Miles. It is very respectful. See, the problem is every other, like every time you see Miles in another universe, they basically treat Miles like Robin. Like, look at the PS4 game. He's basically treated like Robin in in mm -hmm. those games. And when he's when it's when it's when it's in that context, you know, it's fine. And you know what happens to Robin? He eventually decides to go in his own way. And form his own identity. It's like, it's like you have the storyline <laughs> built out for you, and, and and everyone else is doing it. Like the PS4 game, because because Miles is clearly Robin in the PS4 universe. Yeah, he, he has, is. Like that's, you know. Uh, yeah. Also, Genki is basically Oracle. I just yeah. wanted to say it's, that. Like, <laughs> so I want to clarify something. Just because we want like a Falcon to not be Captain America and be Falcon, or like Miles to be another character it doesn't diminish who they are as characters whatsoever they're great characters we just think that they're good enough to to be on be on their own if you if you will instead of having to rely on like the padding of like captain america spider-man like why like it kind of like says it kind of you're kind of like insulting falcon be like the fact that he has to become captain america to be relevant like like it's kind of it's I, i'm i'm going I would say it's racist. It, I was going to say reverse racism, but pre, uh, yeah, pretty it much. Is so ra be because you're saying that these characters aren't good enough to stand on their own. I can tell you right now, Sam and, M and Miles specifically are strong enough to work on their own. You know how I know? They've existed for this long, even before they became Captain America and Spider-Man. Well, I would say Miles only really started to come relevant after Into the Spider-Verse. Well, yeah, but m my point is... These characters have existed for long enough. They're in the zeitgeist. That if, and, and here's the thing. You know what's kind of funny? If you look at comic book shops, whenever they put trades out and they have a series for Miles, they put the Miles Morales first and put Miles Morales, Spider-Man. That's it. See, that's mm -hmm. that's Miles' biggest problem right now. Miles has a very clear identity problem where um, they, they keep trying to say, Miles Morales is Spider-Man, but your own trades, you're not confident enough to call him Spider-Man. They strongly downplay it. Yeah. And instead of giving him his own identity, like Shadow Spider or whatever, 
you know, you you, you keep calling him Miles Morales. Spider like, cloak. Like uh like I, I know that like uh like at least with Spider Gwen, at least Spider Gwen, even though she's Ghost Spider or Spider Woman, at least Spider Gwen alone is enough of a unique identity that she can stand on her own. Yeah, it's not like you, you have the brand confusion of Spider Man or like Thor and Captain the Thor one annoyed me the most because he actually had to change lore in order to make that one make sense. I'm like, if you have to change lore, get out. Yeah, I mean the whole like, what if uh, Miles was whatever? Like, it could have been a fun experiment, but it just, no. I'm talking like... about the uh, I'm talking about the Jane Foster Thor thing. But yes, that was hilarious. The thing is, if it weren't so blatantly racist, it, w- it would have made sense that the Miles by Thor. Odin's fade. It's hammer time. He would say as he as he got the hammer like that was so bad like they even got like even marvel is getting flack by like actual like you know groups and whatever like it was so bad yeah so i'm like and they won't be doing that anymore which they probably will because it's marvel they make these mistakes twice all the time so speaking of adaptability i kind of wanted to to shift this uh into mm-hmm. the other aspect of why i think some characters stand the test of time relatability is one of them but also adaptability so if, yeah jared could you pull up either Amazing Fantasy 15 or the first appearance of, of Batman. Okay. Like, like, whichever, whichever I have the first appearance of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, either of those. Uh, let's let, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's do action comics. Let's do action oh, comics. Okay. I, so, sorry, I was kind of being indecisive. Indecisive. So, like, just flip through the pages. Like, this is what, like, you got to remember, when Superman first premiered, he didn't have his full power set. He couldn't fly. Uh... He acted completely different. He was kind of a, an a-hole in his first appearance. He was New 52 Superman. And this is what Britt and I said when they, when they rebooted Superman in New 52. They put, put him as Golden Age Superman. Mm-hmm. Like, we all know the whole jingle. Like, faster than this being bullet, more powerful than the locomotive. Can jump tall buildings in a single bound. No, no, no. He can leap to, uh, uh, over tall buildings in a single bound. Nick, you got to get it right. Okay, I had a few words wrong. Whatever, sue me. Um, but like, yeah, that like the radio play, like for like like. <sighs> That's where we get kryptonite. No, actually, yeah. Well, the radio show, yes, because uh, I think I've told the story before. The whole reason kryptonite exists is the Superman radio show would run every week. All year round. And the voice actor actor for Superman got two weeks off a year. All right. Jeez. And yeah, it was it was a whatever. Uh, but during those two weeks, they bring in someone else. And the reason they explain it is sorry, everybody, I'm under the effects of kryptonite, and that's why mm-hmm. my voice is different, you know. And and that's how kryptonite, like uh the bat cave, is a result of the serials from the 40s, the Batman serials. Like a lot of these elements come from other media, and they just Hell, been added to Harley Quinn. Yeah, BTS. Um, I think Batgirl was was mainly from the sixties, like the sixties show. Mister Freeze's origin that we all know. Yeah, because if you go back and watch uh, the sixties Batman, it's almost completely unre- like Mister Freeze is completely unrecognizable. Mm-mm. It's not. It's. It, he would be Victor Freeze in one in, in name only. Pretty much. Uh, I'm trying to think of like what other like outside things added added to things or whatever. Um, like She Hulk. You want to know why the only reason She Hulk was created? Why because is that? they were do- they were doing the the Hulk TV show and it was so popular that Marvel created She Hulk simply so that the TV show wouldn't go about creating it and have ownership rights over that character. Oh, that's funny. I like that. That's funny. That is the only reason She Hulk was created was 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 this because because it was because it's, it's an obvious kind of thing to go because like you got to remember this is like the seventies and the sixties because he has a bionic man, the bionic woman, so it was an easy mm-hmm. thing to go. Like, oh, we have the Hulk. What about She Hulk? You know. So that that's the only reason She Hulk was created. Now, there's one more component of comics I think we're leaving out, which we shouldn't. What about the image, people? Because here's the thing about image. A lot of them had really great books. I I read a good portion of them. Wait, 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 wait. I'm getting there. A lot of them had really fun books. 
But yes, uh, Spawn is the only one that has endured for so long of that original batch. I would say the reason for that is a couple different things. Yeah, one, yeah. probably the biggest reason, is the marketing genius of Todd McFarlane. Yes. You know, but also, if you go back and look at them, a lot of them are just derivative. Like, Young Blood is basically X-Men, but with more... It's basically boobs. New Mutants. And, uh, exactly, Wildcats is basically the X-Men. I don't know who, Sa who Savage Dragon would be, but the point is, yeah. But uh, it, 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 it is Eric Larson's barely disguised fetish. No, but the but the thing is, is that the the thing about Image is that here's another reason why because the art was solid. Even if you don't, even if you don't like the writing of all these, because a lot of these guys are artists that don't necessarily write well. The books looked freaking amazing. Yeah, and, and that the thing was, was part Spawn, of it. Spawn wasn't a derivative of anything. I mean, obviously, costume details you could point at different things. Inspired like by like. A little bit of Batman, but Prowler. Prowler, yes. But for the most part, it wasn't like, oh, did, did they have like a similar origin or anything like that. Nope. Uh-uh. But, but like the setup, like <laughs> the whole character, like the whole world, it was original. Like it, like, mm -hmm. like the whole like guy makes it like a guy's an assassin for the government, gets killed, wants to see his wife again, makes a deal with the devil to become a general hell's army and is trying to get out of the deal, got the timer. There was a lot of new elements in that book. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think a lot of people like, like, yes, the art was good. The story itself was pretty decent. Like you go back it and was. look at those original spawn issues. They're actually not bad. Like I have the first Omni of those. The original, like the original spawn run, I say like the first 50 issues, like they're obviously of their time, but like they're still very readable and, and enjoyable too. They're kick ass. You kidding me? They're so badass. But it, 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 and that's the thing. But the only other image character that I think is approaching that level of notoriety, if you will, or already has crossed it, is Invincible. Because here's the thing about I Invincible. Don't well, no, here's the thing: the only other uh, Invincible, the only, no, the only other image comic that caught on, it, it well uh, later Invincible did, is Walking Dead, and that was t literally almost ten years later in the two thousands. Because remember, Walking Dead. Do you know the story Is behind that? What? The story behind how Image agreed to publish The Walking Dead. Go ahead, Jared. All right. So what happened is that Kirkman it came to, uh, to to Image. I forget which of them he did. I think but the point is he showed up. He goes, I have this idea for this zombie comic. And the thing is, there was a lot of zombie stories going out. And, and zombies at the time had not been a big genre. They weren't like very popular in terms of comics. Yeah, late so 90s, he, early 2000s was a very low point for zombies. So, so what he said was, well, I didn't tell you the interesting part. It turns out it's actually the pretext for an alien invasion. I'm going to be laying seeds throughout the first couple of issues. So then the issues come out, and, and they're selling like gangbusters. But the, his editor goes to him. He goes, Robert, where's the evidence of the alien invasion thing? He goes, oh, I just told you that so you'd publish the book. And at that point, it's selling so well, they're like, well, all right. who cares? All right. You got us, and there you go. I, 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 that was a gamble. Like, like this, like Robert Kirkman has some stones on him. Like, I respect that. But the thing, going to Invincible, the thing about Invincible that works, because he, he has that Spider-Man look, but he also has, like, the powers of, like, a Superman to a mm -hmm. degree. So you, you, you deal with that whole great power responsibility. Then you factor in the fact that his father was sent to Earth to, to, to prep it for invasion. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like there's so many layers to that character that it, um, it only serves to, to make him grow as a great character. Plus the other thing about Invincible that like, not a lot of people talk about is it's very passy. Mm -hmm. Like it is very much harkening back to like silver, golden age, like like old style superheroes, but it does it earnestly. Like it's an mm -hmm. earnest pastiche. Like I'm very hesitant to call it like parody or satire. Like it's it's a loving homage to that era. Like it's very much pulling from that, but it's doing it with respect. It's like, hey, we love this. So we are doing this as as a tribute to it. Because so many other books, it's so easy. Like the boys kind of does this. I was about to say the boys. 
the boys and Invincibles are like such mirror image of each other. It's so crazy. Um, it's still fun though. But they're uh, they're ultimately the same thing. They mm-hmm. they are a send up of an era, whereas the boys mocks, like it mocks and pokes fun at fun at it. Like, oh yeah, superheroes suck, and we, we you know it, I know it. Let's just enjoy the ride. Invincibles like. Hey, yeah, superheroes are awesome. You know it, I know it. Let's just enjoy the ride. You know. Yeah, exactly. But, but the thing with the boys, that wasn't popular until the show came out. Because, uh, and and the show, for as crazy as it gets, significantly tones down the level of craziness oh, in that. That's. I mean, just look at the conversation around the boys. It, it definitely revolves around. Oh God, the boys is so terrible. The like the show. Because the show really just translates as, like, the comic, the boys' comic is terrible. Like, ask anybody, they'll agree with you. Whereas if you'll read Invincible, like, it's pretty good. And Invincible is actually a pretty faithful adaptation of the comics. Oh, certain characters they, aside. Yes, and they tell certain events out of order. Like, he doesn't find out, uh, that we don't find out as an audience, uh, that uh, we don't see Omni-Man kill the the guardians until much later in the first arc. I would argue they do that a lot for storytelling purposes. Which is better. I, and I said it in my, my review of Invincible. I like it the way the show did, did it more because then it like completely changes how you look at this character for so long in the season. Yeah. What they do is the Hitchcockian bomb under the table narrative device where basically the beginning of the scene, you see a person put a bomb under the table. And he sets it for two minutes, okay? Covers covers it with a sheet so that and then other people walk in. You know there's a bomb under the table that's gonna that's gonna explode in two minutes. Nobody else in that scene knows there's a bomb under the table. So they're just talking, doing about their business, having dinner. All the while, as it's counting down, you get more nervous because what there's a bomb under the table. You know, it's like you know, it's like you know what's gonna happen, mm-hmm. but it's the anticipation of it happening. That creates suspense. Mm-hmm. It's a very Hitchcockian kind of thing. Sorry, I'm a writer, so it's like I. I it's all good. Like story. That's yeah, why yeah. you have me to break down these storytelling details. But yeah, so th- and that's the th- that that's the genius of that show, and why and add on to the fact that it is extremely accurate to the comic, so y- it benefits from that. Where with the boys. This could be more of a problem with the boys' marketing. It's like, remember the marketing for Herogasm? You mean the the all uh, all sizzle no frizzle? Yeah, because I remember uh, the lead up to it. They were like, "Get ready to go insane!" Or like, even Jansen Ackles is like, "It was a full year. It was a full year of like, yeah. Oh my god, this was terrible to film. We ran out of artificial mm-hmm. male fluids, and you know, like, oh my, it's like." And it was like I watch it, and I'm like, <laughs> it's for a point. It's not even half an episode, though. So I'm watching this, and I'm like, that's it. Yeah. Whereas Herogasm was literally an entire arc of the book, which it, I've seen panels from the actual arc of the book, and yeah, they they def that show turned it. If the boys tone it down that much, ah. Uh, I just, I just think they really kind of. Uh... Mm-hmm. But the point is, that's. I like the boys. I'm not as big of a fan of the boys as I am of like Invincible because yeah, you, you're right. The boys exist to make fun of like superheroes, particularly DC, because each member of the Seven is basically the Justice League. I mean, in all fairness, the boys does mock both sides of the aisle, but they do tend to have a little bit of a bias to one side or the other. But they do actually mock both sides. I will say, I like their whole mocking of the Snyder Cut situation where like he's reading the script and he goes, these Joss rewrites really bring the script together. And then they're like, I'm so glad we can get our full vision out, release the Bork cut. I love how Zack Snyder shared that and goes, thank you that Bork was able to show his full direct. Also, vision. that actor is is very clearly playing like, like a Joss Whedon parody, like, like very clearly. Mm-hmm. Very clearly, yeah. Like, I mean, just look at look at how like his look. He's very clearly playing Joss, like Joss Whedon. Yeah, it's straight down to the obligatory weird kiss between uh, Maeve and this f- and this female minor character just for the sake of it. We don't need to go down that road again, brother. But no, I totally the, the get point that. is, 
what I'm saying is that that's what Joss Whedon does. He will put in se- sex and sex jokes for no reason whatsoever. That's why I yeah, can't but, stand his stuff. So getting back to like what mm-hmm. I was saying, the point is these characters have gone over multiple changes over the years. You know, like we have the Superman of of the 40s, of, of the 30s and the 40s. Then we have like this man of like the 50s and the 60s. Then we have him of like the 70s. Eight, like the point is, these characters are constantly reinvented, but they're done in a way that respects the past. So you have this like unbroken chain of of people who like they share it with their kids. You know, like hey, this might not be my Superman, but I still recognize him as Superman. You're kind yeah, of starting exactly. to get. You're, it's kind of, the chain's kind of been broken within the last five to ten years or so. Um, but, like, yeah, you, you you had this for, like, 50, 60 years where parents would share it with their kids and, you know, they might not be fully on board with this current version of the superhero, but they still recognized it as the superhero they grew up with, you know? And, and that's what Zack did when he was doing his movies. He goes... I'm gonna I'm gonna break them down to to their very fundamental core, so everyone pretty much understands what Superman is. Then I'm gonna build them back up, so now that you understand the core of who Superman is, you appreciate him more. Like Henry Cavill might not be my Superman, but he is still Superman. Like he I still the, recognize him yeah. as Superman. Like I, I'm, I, you know me, I'm the Christopher Reeve fanboy. That's what I grew up with. Which but fine. Henry Cavill is still Superman. He is still Superman, and I recognize him as such. He may not be like my favorite. He's the modern Superman. day Christopher Reeves. Agree, but I'm just using that to kind of mm-hmm. emphasize my point. You know, like yeah, but and, and that's the point, and that's where like the new f- f- Fifty Two did for me because it was like the, the the new when I got into the new Fifty Two was around the time Man of Steel came out, and then when I was watching it, it be, because what good character deconstruction is is when you can understand the character so when they are built up and here's the key part they have to be built up afterwards once they're built up back to where they were before you now understand these because on the surface superman looks boring until you actually get the fundamental core of who he is and then you're like no this is actually one of the greatest characters of all time like that kind of reminds me of an interview i saw with frank miller where he was describing Hit when he rebooted Daredevil, Born Again. But mm-hmm. well, he said what he likes to do is to take is to take apart these characters, like take what works, and then reassemble them in a leaner form. Yeah, you know. So, so what that says to me is, yeah, he's reinventing the character, but he's taking very care, much care, be like, okay, this is a Daredevil of the modern times, but he's still Daredevil. He's still and Daredevil. Look, and if you look at Daredevil. Uh, in that run, yeah, he's still Daredevil, and like I'd say, Daredevil is still be like they're still harkening back. Basically, Frank Miller is the Daredevil, what Denny O'Neill is the Batman. Yes, one hundred percent, one hundred percent, or even Green Arrow. I I don't know as much about that, but okay. I think I'd realize this: our modern interpretation of Batman was born in the seventies by Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams. Heavily from that, have help. Rachel freaking ghoul. Exactly. Like, yeah, that is where our modern interpretation of Batman comes from. Like, before that was the 60s Batman, and before that was, like, a wild we went through different things. Like, the Batman we know it started in the 70s. In fact, the best, one of the best parts of that DC superpowered documentary is, actually, ironically, in the part where they talk about the 1966, and the, what they say is that what that show taught people is that you can tell different ver- versions of Batman and them still be great as long as you keep to that fundamental core of who Batman is. Then you're good because these characters are adaptable. You can put them in like a comedy, uh, as in the case of Harley Quinn, and and you can still have them be, I know it's Batman or Superman or Wonder Woman. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and like I think one of the problems we have is with the more modern age is you have a lot of people that come in and they try to do these revamps and some of them work, some of them don't, a lot of them don't. Jared, what would you say is a modern reinvention of like the last oh let's say five to ten years that has worked? And Scott's new 52. on Batman. All right, but I'm 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 doing post new fifty two. 
post new 52 now that's a question that's an interesting question probably because obviously we know you're a new 52 fanboy so i want to take that out of the equation because like wonder woman hasn't worked uh i uh, tevi is going to agree with me when i say john kent hasn't worked both times I i feel like batman has kind of he's been on a bit of cruise control but like i feel like he's been handled relatively well like i feel like because Probably he's the, why the, the the best mm-hmm. like new addition it, to Batman lore post new pitch has been Batman who laughs. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a caveat on there. I disagree because that's an example of something that started out good, but they pushed it too hard and then it fell apart. Okay, too much of a good thing. Because th- that is the thing. Because if you push a character too hard, as in the case of like Kamala Khan or like. Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, they're gonna fall to obscurity. Did you see uh, the panel of Moon Girl literally lecturing Tony Stark about how you're not the smartest person? I am. No, no, no. She was lecturing Reed Richards. <sighs> yeah, that's even worse. But if if I had to pick a reinvention, the Flash. Really? What Jeremy Adams did particularly Wally West because Wally West went through a ton of character assassination going all the way back to the new 52. Then they brought back red haired Wally and he was still dealing with a lot of trauma and stuff. And and this is where you get like heroes in crisis. Then the Jeremy Adams run comes in and completely redeems that character. That's an, that's a time when you can take a character that's been in the slums and bring him right back to where he belongs. It's very rare that you can do that. Because by all intents and purposes, Wally West should have been a dead character because of all the BS that DC had put him through. But Jeremy Adams managed to take him and say, no, I'm going to put him back on that pedestal where he belongs. Awesome. So, like, it's really easy for us to complain about what doesn't work. Like, everyone does that. We could do this. We could probably get a good showing on this. We probably get good views out of this, but that's not how we operate here. We operate on the positives. So, like, well, we touch upon the negatives, but I want to more. I want to more focus on the positives. So, so Jared, let me ask you a question. Within the last uh, fifteen years, like I'm going to say, two thousand five till till today, what are some new characters that are introduced that you think will stick around? Jessica Cruz, absolutely, because of. Oh. Mm-hmm. How her fear goes with the Green Lantern thing. Agreed. Like, like I, we're, we're talking about in the pre-show. I feel like Kyle and Guy are slightly starting to fade away. Kyle, in particular, it, it, you know, it's kind of it depends. Away. It depends if they're thrown into a movie because DC will push them hard for a movie or something like that. It really depends. You'd be surprised. But the thing is, like, uh, like John has the benefit of being in Justice League, and he's kind of showing up with a few other things. And then Hal is Hal. So is Kyle, other- so, so is Kyle because Kyle was in S Tas and in Justice League for one episode. <laughs> True. The Whereas other char- John was literally in the entire series. Mm-hmm. The other character that I think could could at least have have a comeback is Yara Floor. That was the one Future State character that everyone's like, please keep this character around. What about Marvel? Like any new Marvel characters that that have been that uh, have been introduced, you think might stick around? Past fifteen years, uh, probably. I, like I've, I've said, Spider Gwen. Like I, I don't know if it, that was like in the pre-show or like here. I think Spider Gwen is going to. I don't well, think I don't I don't think Gwenpool will. I I think Gwenpool is kind of a gimmick character. She's a gimmick character. I would say obviously the Winter Soldier. Or at uh, least yeah. some form of some form of him. Yeah, because uh the Winter Soldier, like you gotta remember, he didn't show up till like what 2007? Yeah, Lad didn't know that, but when I told him that it blew his mind because he thought he was around for like a really long time. Yeah, that's the thing too. It's like you 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 swear he's been around a lot longer. That just speaks to how good of an idea the character is. Unless I forget, he got the he got a fantastic redemption arc where Steve dies and he becomes Captain America. And they directly in that Ed Brubaker run deal with the concept because the public finds out what he did before he was Captain America and he has to deal with that. Yeah. And, and then you add on the, the relationship with a Black Widow, which that's my Marvel ship. But 
anyway, that's that that's the Marvel Super Wonder, in case you're wondering on that. So what other what other uh new characters? Um none of the all new all difference, I think, are gonna show up because even their if even their movie projects are failing, they're not gonna they're not gonna last. So obviously we can talk about like Miles and Gwen, but what about some of the other spider people like Silk? Like Silk, while popular with mm. cosplayers, the certain type of cosplayer, if you know what I mean. I don't really see her having no. much more fanfare outside of just oh oh uh, die sub suit model and definitely and definitely not Spider Boy. This is directly at you, Dan Slot. I've never even heard of that character. Spider Boy is Spider Man and Miles is sidekick that Dan Slot tried to ret is trying to retcon that has been with Spider Man since the beginning. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. But <laughs> besides. Like, like, he, like, Slot is trying to give Spider-Man a Robin, when literally Miles is his Robin. Like, I, I said this before. Like, like Miles effectively, uh, in in all in all effects. Like, they be, like you look at it, like like Spider-Man PS4. Miles is treated like a Robin in those games. If you agreed here. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And I'm not trying to say this to demean. By him. the way, it's just that's the slot he fills in. Here's a character who's not going to show up uh, anymore. I'm going to share my screen real quick. This is a character that was added in the new uh, in the new Hawkgirl series, and right here. Uh, can you zoom in? I can't see it that well. Yeah, hang on. I I'm trying to see if I can zoom in a little bit, uh, a bit better, but she's in there for like a really small time. Yeah, see, when you have to have Batman come in and say, you belong here, and I'm like, yeah. Also, it, it appears we're having a cameo by Max Presley in this show. So love you, Max. You're probably watching this, so I love you, brother. Yeah, we actually asked him to, to be on the panel, but he was busy, so he made it out here anyway. Here's another character I think is going to be here for a while: Jaime Reyes. Because even though his movie is not really performing up to snuff, I've read his comics; it's really good. Yeah, because Jaime uh, kind of fills in because DC doesn't really have many like Iron Man type characters. Like they, they they've tried. I think Jaime really slots into like that that tech character kind of kind of slot really well. Mm -hmm. And his, his his powers are actually really unique, like really creative. And plus like even though he hasn't had a mainline push, he's had a push in the animated the animated movies. He's shown up in a lot of those. He's shown up in Injustice. Um like he's showing up in a lot of the side media, so for a lot, a lot people, of people, popular side media. That's the key part there. Agreed. So for a lot of people, Jaime is Blue Beetle, like Ted Cord. Who's Ted Cord? And uh, yeah, I, I I definitely feel like like Jaime, um, he's still kind of in like that Teen Titans kind of tier, but there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Hell, for the longest time, Teen Titans was DC's top selling book. That is true. Uh, one character that I wish would kept, would have caught on was Rose Wilson. I really like uh, her character and like the idea of her character. Well, but Ravenger yeah. really never really caught on big time. She shows up. She so it shows up. And the thing about her is that she only shows up in parts that involve the Teen Titans because she is heavily tied to the Teen Titans. So I, so if the Teen Titans get like more attention, that translates to more attention on her. Yeah, like uh, I think they used her in uh, was it season two of Titans, and they basically yes, had her in season. She was, I think she, she was Terra. She basically took the place of Terra in the Judas Contract storyline, mm -hmm. which I really wasn't a fan of. The problem is there really isn't like a definitive like look and origin because like it's all over the place. It's like Arrow season two had Ravenger, and it was Ravenger, but not Ravenger. You know, it's just like. It was ba they basically did the Judas contract, but with a different character. And then literally season, I think it was like four or five, they did the Judas contract with Artemis. It's like... Hmm. But the thing, the thing is, it's like... Yeah, it's a, she is one of the occasions where it's heavily heavily focused on an IP, uh, on a, a separate IP like Teen Titans. The other, the character that I don't think will last long is Naomi. Because here's the thing, I I like that Bendis wanted to have a tribute to Dwayne McDuffie, but the problem is with that character when you try and force her on people, like when he tried to force her on the Justice League, 
it it doesn't work because the audience sees through that real fast. An another character that I think will stick around, and mm -hmm. by the way, Tevya, this next section is for you. So, Damian? Well, well, no, I was going to say Jonathan Kent. I disagree. Well, not in, not in his current form. I believe if you look at like uh, like Superman and Lois, there is distinctly a demand for a teenage Superman. Like, look at how popular Superboy stories have been. Like, Smallville. Like, there needs to be a teenage Superboy learning the powers, dealing with that but, stuff. But, 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 let me cook. Let me cook. I'm, I'm basically both, both going off of Superman and Lois here. So, so the, the current problem. version... I'm trying to cook here. Uh, the current version they have in the DC Comics doesn't work. Okay. They need to bring it back to teenage high school hijinks with Clark as Superman, and his is either Superboy or some other some other name. Here's the problem: John's redundant because you have Connor. <sighs> That's why I think he's not gonna he's not gonna last long. Because if you really want that, I I agree. You need that. You have Connor. I don't know. Like I feel like Connor's been around long enough. They need to Nightwing him. Like you know, because because like basically like these these sons, you should treat them like Robins to an, an extent. Like John is the Damien, and Connor is is the night is the is the Grayson. <laughs> you, you know, and that's what you need to do is is you need to have Connor have his own identity. Um, you know, Nightwing him like give him his own separate identity, his own super identity. He's still part of the super family, if you will. And then John, like basically. Here's the age range. John is for the 11 to 14 year old kids. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like he is middle school to early high school. Uh, Connor is for the senior in high school through college age people. Like he's for the late teen, early adult. Cause like those are two definitely and two, like basically between like middle school Peter Parker and college age Peter Parker. To be clear, Tavia, we're not saying they're going to de-age him. That's never going to happen right now because... I'm saying they should de-age him. That They should, but they won't. Here's why. Because John has become an LGBT icon, and they can't because then you take that away. Well, I'm, I'm sure once uh, once uh, the the uh, fu uh, the funds dry up and they, and they need to actually sell comics, oh, they're going to be doing but a the lot of stuff real quick. The problem is with that is that there's so many different levels that they could go to before they go to John Kennedy. He's that much of an irrelevant character that he's like at the bottom of their priorities. If they have to like f fix their publishing line uh, the top is like Batman, obviously, because if, if Batman's not selling comic book shops shut down, but that's, that's, a, that's actually a joke in the comic book collecting market, but it, it's like the, they'll go down a list and there's like 80 superheroes before you get to John being a priority. Well, well, J fixing John would be basically be a part of fixing the Superman line. Like he's part of that. Like, okay, how are we going to fix the whole Superman line? And John is a part of that. The problem is they're doing it now, and honestly, it's doing a pretty good job. John of DC is actually looking like it's them fixing DC. And I said this before: the publishing initiative they're doing right now is actually working out pretty well, except for the fact that they interrupted with Night Terrace. But that's besides the point. That's going on with that. But the thing is, here's the thing. John, the problem with John again is that he see the thing is, I don't know. I, I still don't think that they because the amount of because I don't think DC want is willing to endure the backlash that they would get if they were to DH him. Granted, the, the backlash would be mostly among the people that don't read comics, but that's the it's thing. My my thing is. There has always been a uh, demand for a high school Superman and the learning the powers. Like you, like, like, like I said, Smallville, the Superboy show. Like, there's always been a popularity for a Superboy character. Like the idea of, oh, I have all these powers and I'm still trying to navigate high school. What am I gonna do? It's like it's easy melodrama, and people. There is a demand for those, those type of stories. So I think John Kent can fill that void. It's it's a, it's it's like it's like it, it's the same it's the same problem with the Spider-Man line. Like they're afraid to age up Peter Parker, 
when they literally have Miles Morales sitting right there who, do you want to do high school Spider-Man stories? Give it to Miles. Have Peter be the like late late 20s, 30s, four, even 40s Peter Parker who's sailing Mentor. around. Exactly. And you can, you can still have Peter Parker do his stories. You can have your cake and eat it too. This is the thing that frustrates me. Marvel can literally have their cake and eat it too. They can have Miles do all like the high school hijinks and, and relate to all those people. And then for the older fans, they have Peter Parker. He's still doing Spider-Man stuff. He's, he marries Mary Jane. Bangs out May, May, May Day. That's for you, Tevia. And, and then like have all the great stuff. Like they can literally have both. But the problem is that, right, is that is that the editorial for these companies are run by as West from Thinking Critical Cause and the Legion of Doofuses. They don't know. They're either willfully ignoring, which is scarier, or they don't know what the fans actually want. Like Case in point, in the Zeb Wells run, they allowed Peter Parker to go, well, I've always considered Mary Jane more of a sister. Uh, what? That's what they had him say in the current run of Spider-Man that no one likes. But I'm like, you slept with her? What do you mean, always? You slept with your sister? <laughs> Marvel doesn't oh. realize how bad this is. Yeah. What in the Back to the Future hell are we getting into? That's my point. I'll, what you're saying makes sense, but the editorial won't. And the, and the thing is, going back to High School Superman, we did have that. Post-Crisis uh, Connor with the t-shirt and the jeans, he literally was that. The problem is, that's why I think what DC should, should just do. Hard reboot, do another Flashpoint, reboot. You don't have to have to show us the origins of the characters all again because we've seen that 80 freaking times. Just have the status quo be, okay, Superman, uh, Batman, one of them, the Justice League exists. Co Death of Superman has happened. We don't need to see that again. Have Connor be like the t-shirt and the jeans guy again and then good to go. So, so what you're saying is DC needs to go in a hashtag new direction. Yes, exactly. They do. And if you want to see how to properly execute, <laughs> sorry, that, you set me up for that. You set, and if you, you set want me to see the proper way to to conduct s such an experiment, go to Jay Blaze's channel. We love you, Jay. We love you, brother. Sorry, you set me up so well. Yeah, I know. I know. So yeah, um, let's kind of wrap this up a little bit because yep. this was a, a this was a, a great good discussion. Kind of morphed into like a what's wrong with like modern stuff, but. I feel like the, you're the, always going to talk about that, though. Yeah, I mean, I kept it loose on a purpose, so it's it's all good. So, so Jared, what are your final thoughts, and where can people where can people find you? So you can find me at Comics League on YouTube, Comics League JT on Twitter, Comics League 2020 on Instagram, and basically, my final thoughts are these companies need to get their act together because the potential is there. They don't realize that they have literally the most well-known IP in the world, and they are squandering it. Yeah. If you have Superman, you have no, you have no excuse. Yep. So uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for this. I hope you're enjoying uh, this, this really good episode of Comic Spots. We're doing uh, more for you here uh, shortly. So you can find me. Uh, remember to go to the places below. Uh, also, don't forget to subscribe to my Patreon. Link will be in the description below. And uh, yeah, Screechers launching now October 6th. We're going to be launching it on the Friday Night Friend. He's going to be awesome! So anyway, this has been Nick for the Phoenix Press. And remember, I can only show you the door. You're supposed to walk through it. <laughs>